Father, we are your humble servants gathering on your holy day, on this holy day, to worship and praise you, Holy Father. We ask that your presence be here, enlighten us, open our minds, surround us with your holy angels. There's so many things that are, are bombarding us throughout the week. It's our time now to draw close to thee. Help us in this relationship of drawing closer to you on this personal day that we can be close to thee. In Jesus' name. Let your words be heard from the pulpit. Amen. 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 Well, I don't know about the rest of you, but I have been growing. Amen. Tremendously. God has just been pouring out blessings. Well, I have a praise report. I saved it until I got up here. The praise report is that I can actually see that we're going to finish our church on time. Amen. And I'm excited. God has blessed us through people, through his agents. That's how he works. He touches hearts, convicts souls. They come forward and they stand for truth and they stand on the platform of eternal truth and they help us, God's people, to finish that end time work. Amen. What a blessing. What a blessing. So I'm excited. I'm getting more and more excited every day that goes by because I can actually see the, the end of this project that we've been on for three years coming, coming up soon. But it's not an end that excites me. It's a beginning. It's a home base of operation for the whole Gulf Coast for our ministry. And I'm excited to be in it. And the work is before us, as we've been learning in the Three Angels' messages. There's a lot of people missing here today. And it's because of weather. It's because of the health, the health issues. And, and whatever the reasons might be, we'll keep them in prayer. Uh, our church family. Uh, even myself, you know, the, we are bombarded throughout the week with different things. And uh, it's just a blessing to be able to be here. Blessing to be here. So the praise report is the fact that we have a new beginning about to start here on the Gulf Coast. And we have our work before us. And uh, I'm excited. Now that I've said that, the sighing and crying time is here as well. <laughs> <laughs> so there's the good, and here's the other. Let us sigh and cry. Why? Well, we've been learning it. Sigh and cry for our brothers and sisters everywhere. Amen. We need to take this everlasting gospel to them, don't we? So we've been studying the three angels' messages. By the way, all those who sigh and cry are going to be sealed into the message under the three angels' messages. For clarity purpose, I want to clear something up. My, my comprehension and my understanding. Are there people of old that have the seal of God? Yes. Yes. There are people of old that have the seal of God. We've discovered what that seal represents and what it means. And we've gone into the intellectual understanding on it, right? Settling on the truth. Right. Well, that's the sum of it. That's the sum. The settling into the truth. The intellectual, but now a seal, God's seal, is to be settled both intellectually and spiritually. Remember, Jesus says God seeks those who will worship him in truth and in spirit. spirit. What does that mean for us? We can have the intellectual, but without the relationship, can you be sealed? No. Who is it that seals us into the day of redemption? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going to ask you all this question because my brother Danny brought it up this week. He said, you know that thing that's saying that you say hundreds of times over and over repeatedly, Houston? The knowledge of the holy, the knowledge of the holy. All right, I'm going to ask again. 
Brother Danny, please don't blurt out the answer. <laughs> what is the knowledge of the holy? And what is the signet upon that gold plate of the seal that's on the high priest fair mitre? It was holiness unto yod heh wah -Heh. Holiness unto yod heh wah -Heh. So all those who were sealed under the third angel's message who are going to be translated, who are alive on earth when Jesus returns are going to be what? Holy unto the Father. So what is the knowledge of the holy? Now I said a mere intellectual knowledge will not save you. Well, this pretty much sums it up. What is the knowledge of the holy? The knowledge of the holy is, here it is, <laughs> understanding. That's biblical. The knowledge of the holy is understanding. And how can you understand? Unless the Holy Spirit leads you. Line upon line. Here a little, there a little. Get the intellectual and let Christ's spirit work within you to lead you into all truth. Amen? Amen. Amen. So in Ephesians chapter 1, I'm not going to go there right now. We'll bring it up next week. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 4, and if he, all the way from chapter 1 of Ephesians to chapter 6 of Ephesians, it talks about the seal and what it means to be sealed and who it is that seals you. Did y'all know that? Paul addresses the Ephesians with this. As a matter of fact, Ephesians chapter 1, it is the Holy Spirit who seals you. Ephesians chapter 4, it is the Holy Spirit who seals you. And the message to the Laodicean church in Revelation chapter 3, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And Ephesians chapter 6, put on the whole armor of God. And that whole armor of God represents the sanctuary message in, it, in entirety, totality. And we've covered this in the past. And it gets, I think Brother Bill and I had a little study on that the other day, didn't we, Brother? On the whole armor of God and how it relates to the sanctuary message. There's seven stations in the sanctuary. You had the door. You had the altar of sacrifice. You had the brass labor. You had the table of showbread. You had the, and brother, we're going to go over it many, many times. I, I'm so redundant. I cover it. I won't let, I'm not going to let it dry right here. We're going to keep covering this over and over. And my church family will attest to that. And then you had the table of showbread, the menorah. You had the golden altar of incense. And then you had the Ark of the Covenant. How many is that? That's the number of perfection. And the number of perfection is totality. That's God's number, seven. Amen. So if you look at the whole armor of God, shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Gird up your loins with the belt of truth. Take up the, the sword of the spirit and the shield of faith. Put on the helmet of salvation. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. It covers all the parts. So shod your feet is the door, and the door is dialing. And it's the preparation of the gospel of peace, not the gospel of peace. It's understanding. If you have the preparation of something, you must what? You must understand it. And don't worry if we don't, if we do not remember the, the chapters in the verses, it's okay. It's okay. Because guess what? Chapters and verses did not exist in the original transcripts. The main thing is you remember the substance. Amen. So a lot of times when you say, well, I can't remember. You know, I tried this and I tried. It's okay. You got the substance. If I begin to say something, you can recite the rest of it because you abide in the word and you became a branch to the vine, which is Jesus Christ. Amen. Not Houston Taylor. So the knowledge of the holy is no one can understanding. Answer that? <laughs> well, we just covered this, y'all. <laughs> All right, let, let me let's start over. Wake up. 
The knowledge of the holy is understanding. And the only way you can understand is to get the intellectual. And to get the intellectual, you have to behold or abide in. And Jesus himself is going to do the heart change. God will place his son's spirit into your heart to allow you to be able to cry out, Abba, Father. I'm not even started the sermon yet. <laughs> that's, normal. that's just normal. Yeah, we just, and the only reason why I want to share all this is to kind of bring us up to speed. We've been covering the three angels' messages. We're on the third angel right now. And in that third angel's message, I said, there is righteousness by faith in verity. Now, the big question for most people is where is it? Don't you ask yourself that when you read it? Where is that message in that third angel's message? You know what's been so amazing in this study for me? Is how much is in each one of these messages. It's unreal. I had no idea until I myself went back to it. It's kind of like this. When you're a toddler, you're not allowed to go into deep water because you'll drown. When you're a toddler, you don't get fed strong meat because you'll choke. The first time I read my Bible, I was a toddler. When I got into my Bible and I read it from cover to cover, I was a toddler. And when I got to strong meat, I said, Lord, I want the strong meat. Where is it? Where is it? I want it. I couldn't receive it. But I had to continue to abide. You know, when you're a toddler, your mother don't let you go in the deep end of the swimming pool, does she? She keeps you in the little toddler pool that's real shallow up close, and she keeps a close eye on you, don't she? That's what Christ does with us. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He says, you abide in me, and I'm going to do that heart change. So as you grow, as we grow together, and we get out of the shallow water, we go a little deeper, don't we? Get a little deeper into the water. And eventually you're swimming. Now, if somebody would just throw you in, some of us might learn to swim in an instant. Well, that's, what it, that's what's happening in these last days. People are going to have to learn to swim fast. Er. er. <laughs> As my wife says. So there's a whole lot of information, but I'm going to tell you right now, that only Christ can do that change within us. So it's not that mere intellectual knowledge that's going to get us into heaven. It's not going to happen that way. It's got to be a relationship with you and your bridegroom. That's right, man. <laughs> that's a hard concept to wrap our minds around, isn't it? A bridegroom, I got to be the bride? Yeah, we're all the bride. Every one of us. We're all the bride. That's the divine pattern. Husband, wife. Father, son. Husband, wife. Actually, it's father, son. Son, man. Husband, wife. Divine pattern. So sometimes we, as men, can learn from our wives. Oh, that's a new concept. <laughs> Sometimes we can learn from our wives what it means to be a wife. That's a new concept, isn't it? Or just study the Word of God and let Jesus lead us. Or both. Both. We can learn a lot. There is a divine pattern to these messages. Turn me in your Bibles to Revelation 14, 9 through 12. Revelation 14, 9 through 12. You know, sometimes I get real passionate when I'm sharing the word. I'm going to try to contain myself a little bit more. And if I get too excited, somebody just call my name and say something sometimes. Sometimes I do get a little excited. 
<clears throat> Let's go back to this third angel's message. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image. Well, that can mean many different things. But it's an image beast. And the beast also has an image set up in our midst. And receive his mark in his forehead or his hand. So the beast mark can be received in the forehead or in the hand. Where can God's seal be received? Forehead only. Forehead only. Only. Remember what I said? Jesus says in the last book of Revelation, Behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me to give every man according as his work has been. You're rewarded according to your work. But you cannot be saved according to your work with the seal of God. With the mark of the beast, you can be marked with what you believe or what you do. If you have come to the truth and you reject it and you continue to support the beast after you know the truth, then that mark is going to be in your hand. From your works. Not because you believe, but because you stayed after you knew the truth and continued to support that power. Y'all with me? That's hard, isn't it? That's pretty tough. But the problem is, is you can tell people, but because of their indifference and uncaring condition, they'll continue to support the beast. Or they'll continue to support wrong agenda. And that's what's happening. And that's why the mark of the beast can be received either here or here. Sighing and crying time. So it's beneficial, Houston, for me to stay here. That's what I hear sometimes. Or I stay here because... And when I hear that, I, I always remind them. You know, brother, that mark can be received in two places. It's kind of like being a Sabbath keeper. When you know the truth and you walk away and leave it in the judgment, they're going to be held more accountable. You know why? Because they had the the advantages to have the truth. And when they had those special advantages, and they knew the truth, and they rejected it, and there's people out here that's done it, there's still hope. It's still not too late. Probation is not closed yet, unless they have totally grieved the Holy Spirit away. They can still turn back. Our brothers and sisters need to understand there's still time to escape the persecution that's coming. But that mark can be found in two places. Forehead or in the hand. Verse 10. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God which is poured out without mixture into the cup of indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image. And whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Now, y'all tell me, where is the whole message of righteousness by faith and verity in that? Did anybody see it? Okay, let's continue to read. And verse 12. Sometimes I play with y'all a little bit. <laughs> Let's continue to read. Verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. The patience of who? The saints. The saints. Here are they that what? Keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. They keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The faith of Jesus is the testimony of Christ. And the testimony of Christ is from Old and New Testament. Now, I hear people say, and now here's a little twist on it. All you got to do is keep the faith of Jesus. 
And they'd say, all you have to do is just allow Jesus to save you. Well, I'm going to tell you this. When those commandments come, you better be ready to go to work. Because work without faith is dead. And faith without works is dead. You show me your faith without works and I'll show you my faith by works. Amen. Neither exist. Y'all with me? James says that. In case anybody's wondering. It's not confusing. But most of the world today says, I'm saved through grace. I'm saved by grace. There's no faith in there. The faith of Jesus is to be a student or a disciple in the school of Christ. Amen. You want the faith of Jesus? Learn about Jesus. Study Jesus. Adopt his ways. Behold him that you may become like him. Just don't proclaim, I got Jesus in me and I'm saved. That doesn't sound like a race of endurance to me. It's got to be a race of endurance. It's got, you know what? I'm going to tell you this. God wants you to cooperate with him. And it's free will. It's all about the free will. So much of the world today says, oh, I have the faith of Jesus. I can move mountains. But they don't understand that means that they should be abiding in the school of Christ. They should be branches of the vine. They have missed the whole big picture. We have the advantage of having his words right here. Unless you eat my flesh, for all the pastors out there that are teaching, all you got to do is just simply believe. Well, you do have to believe. But that word believe has two parts, pistis and pistol. Do you know what that is? That's faith. That's the noun and the verb form. The noun is Jesus, person, place, or thing. The verb is the action. Faith in the verb form, faith in the noun form. Some pastors are saying you don't need the noun form. Just keep the verb form. All you got to do is believe. Just do it. What is the faith of Jesus? How about this? Enter the school of Christ. That's the faith of Jesus. Learn about him. Learn about the shadows and the substance. Follow his life. Three and a half year ministry. If you don't do nothing else, follow his life. We preach it. We taught it. We study it. And we're going to continue to study it. Because he is my perfect example. I'm going to build up something today. As a matter of fact, I'm just going to tell you. Those 144,000 that y'all are striving to be like are called saviors. Why are they called saviors? Do they save anybody from their sins? No. They oh, am I wetting the appetite now? Is these saviors going to save you? No. No. Well, then why are they called saviors? You know, I'm, I've got an inquiring mind. I always have to ask these questions. Oh, look at that. Why, why do the 144,000 get called saviors? Because they are so much like Jesus. Because they're so much like Jesus. How did they become like Jesus? Well, they're the saints, right? They are the saints. They're the 144,000. They will not taste death. That's right. I said the sealing time began in 1844. But these particular saints do not taste death. But the sealing time began in 1844. Is that wetting some more appetites? Well, how is that possible? But will they be will they be one of those number of the hundred forty four thousand? They will be raised to be but among them. They will be raised and be among them. We've already concluded that, hadn't we? You can't be one hundred and forty four thousand in number with them, but you will definitely be raised in a special resurrection among them. and be among them. And that's the promise. It's right here. Right here. We're getting ready to read it. Let's continue on. See, this third angel's message, I said, was the sealing angel. Remember last week's sermon? Yes. 
He is the sealing angel. Ezekiel chapter 9, Revelation chapter 7, Revelation chapter 14. This third angel is the sealing angel. And when this sealing took place, there was a door shut and there's a door opened. Y'all with me? Christ gets up and goes where in 1844? At the end of 2,300 day prophecy. Most holy place. Most holy place. Y'all see where I'm going with this? <clears throat> so let's continue on. We said the question here was, going back to our subject right here at hand. Where is the message in this third angel's message of righteousness by faith in verity? It's in verse 12. Let's read it again. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that what? Keep the commandments of God. What is that faith of Jesus? That those saviors have. Testimony of Jesus. They are so much like Christ, they look like Christ. In character. You want to see an example of one of those 144,000 given from the Old Testament? Daniel. Look at Daniel. Remember what I said when we first went into this study? Mm -hmm. The book of Daniel and the book of the three angels' messages are locked together. You want to know what the 144,000 look like? Study Daniel. But start out with Jesus. <laughs> because that's where Daniel started. With Jesus. And you know, if you follow Jesus' life, if you follow Jesus' life in a three and a half year ministry that he walked, that's a short ministry, isn't it? That he walked on this earth in his ministry time from the time he was baptized at the Jordan River to the time of his crucifixion, guess how many years? Three and a half years. There's a whole lot of stuff that happened in that three and a half years. That's what we need to be studying. Right there. Guess what that is? How about this? It's outside the door of the sanctuary. When you study this three and a half year period, you are under the schoolmaster who is leading you to Jesus. Oh, that's a different concept too, isn't it? He's leading you to Jesus and he's revealing your need for a what? Savior. A what? Savior. Savior. So you begin to study this Savior and this Savior is going to bring you to the door to doubt it. All right. Let me just sum it up for you. Shod your feet with the preparation of what? Peace. Gospel of peace. That's not peace. It's the what? Gospel. The gospel of peace. And where do I find the gospel of peace so that I might learn to prepare myself that I can help others to prepare? In the three and a half year ministry of Jesus outside the courtyard. That's where you find it. That's where your feet are. Walk this way this is the way I am the way Isaiah says I think it's in Isaiah 26 this is the way walk ye in it Jesus said I am the way there it is I am the way three and a half year ministry bringing you to the door of the sanctuary and then when you step through the door into the outer court, Jesus is standing there to greet you. And his very next words is, I am the truth. And then as he brings you past the altar of sacrifice into adoption by his own spirit before the Father, he brings you on into the, mo into the holy place. Not the most, but the holy place. And then he looks you in the face and he says, my child. I am the light. Is that lining up for you? I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the light. It's a beautiful message. All we have to do is study. 
Follow, learn, abide in him. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, there is no life in you. And many disciples at that point turned and went another way. How many disciples today of Israel have turned and went another way because they cannot receive it because it's such a hard saying? I'm getting excited again. <laughs> How many disciples go a different direction? A lot. Seven. A lot. A multitude. And then Jesus at this point in John chapter 6 turns and he looks at his 12 disciples and he says, will you also turn back? Will you also turn back? You know, let me tell you this. He who puts his hand to the plow and turns back is not worthy of what? The kingdom of heaven. And what does Peter say? No, Lord. You have the words of eternal life. Let's go back to our lesson. All right, so right here. Here is the patience of the saints, verse 12. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. So God's true church on earth, the saints, will be a commandment-keeping people who have the faith of Jesus. They abide in the school of Christ, and they seek to serve their husband and please him. Let me tell you what their commandments are. That's the Ketubah contract. The Ketubah contract. Christ has presented his marriage covenant to you and I. He says, wife to be. Here's my, what I expect of you. Here's what I'm going to expect of you. He said, now, when you agree to this, here's what I promise to do for you. All you have to do is accept me. Isn't that a different way to look at it? Those commandments are not grievous. They're a joy. You know why they're a joy? Because you love to please your husband. Don't you? Oh, that's a tough concept for men, isn't it? All right, let me just rephrase it. Please your master. All right, let me rephrase it again. Please your savior. All right, let me rephrase it again. Please your father of humanity. I mean, there's many different ways that we can look at this. But I personally like the divine pattern of marriage. Because that's what it is. Why would I say that? I'm going to tell you why, men and women. Christ has married you. How has he married you? The two, the twain, the two became one. How does the two become one? Divinity and humanity is mysteriously blended together in the one person, the one being, Jesus Christ. He has married humanity for all eternity. Is that too deep? All we have to do is accept. You know, sometimes I think that uh, in our own human natures, we're a little lazy. Oh, I got to read all that. <laughs> oh, I got to study that. Oh, I can't do it. It's just too much. Let me refine. I will go back to the Garden of Gethsemane again. Remember what I said about that three and a half year period? Of the school of Christ? I hadn't even begun to preach the sermon today. In that three and a half year period of the school of Christ, at the Garden of Gethsemane, Remember what Jesus said, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from before me. He didn't want to do it. He did want to do it. But it was not something that he wanted to take on right then. When he was faced with all of our sins. Not only was he faced with all of our sins, that cup would bring forth a separation from him and his own father. Father, if it be your please, if it if it be your will, let this cup pass from before me. Three times he prayed that prayer. 
while the demons of darkness were bombarding him. So sometimes when I'm feeling a little lazy and I don't want to read or I don't want to, maybe I should reflect on the Garden of Gethsemane picture. In the school of Christ, the faith of Jesus. What is faith? Think about this. I hear all these people making a whole doctrine out of one word. Simply, let's go right to the scripture. What is faith? Faith comes by hearing. And hearing the word of God. And hearing is of the word of God. That's what faith is. So you want the faith of Jesus? Abide in the word. Study his life. Study his character. Become him by beholding him. And then you will develop the faith of Jesus. Let's get the right concepts developed. Okay, so going back to verse 12. Verse 12 is righteousness by faith and verity. Y'all see it? This is the ones that wear the seal of God. We've covered the seal of God repeatedly. Turn with me in the Bible to Revelation 7, 1 through 4. Revelation 7, 1 through 4. Say amen when you're there. Amen. I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth. We talked about that. Holding the four winds of the earth. That's strife, wars, contentions, political, religious authorities persecuting God's people. That the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the what? The seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice. With a what? Loud voice. With a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. Saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed our the till we till we have sealed the servants. How many angels is coming from the east? From the way of the north, from the higher gate, as Four. Ezekiel puts it. How many sealing angels come from the way of the east? One. Right here. I saw another angel. How many angels is that? Angels. That's singular. I saw another angel. I saw one angel coming from the east. Now Saying in verse 3, y'all look at verse 3 now, pay close attention. We read this last week, I'm going to recap now. Saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we, till who? Then we, we have sealed. To how many people? I thought it was just one angel. Why did it go from singular to plural? Well, let's continue to read. Till we have sealed the servants of who? Oh, it's still plural. Nothing changed. In their foreheads. Now, do you remember what I said? You are the three angels. Mm -hmm. I said, those mighty angels, you are not that mighty angel, by the way, that ascends from the north, from the higher gate, from the way, coming from the east. But you are the messengers of God's last day message. And these angels want to work with you. What did I tell you the seal of God was? If I sum up the seal of God, what would the summary be? Let me give it to you. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to be so redundant, you're going to get tired of hearing it. The sapling. Oh, All right, my wife knows it perfectly. Because she's heard it a hundred times from me already. And we talk about it. It's the settling in the truth, both spiritually and intellectually, to the point that you cannot be moved or shaken. I said into the truth. Not into error. Not into false doctrine. Not into presumptuous sins. Into the truth. To the point that you cannot be shaken or moved. That's to be sealed. Now, I'm going to stop here for one minute. And I want to enlighten you on something. Share something with you. The 144,000 will be translated from the earth among men. According to the word of God. They're all going to be sealed. But the sealing time began in 1844, and those that were sealed in 1844, are they still living today? No. So how can they not taste death if they're already dead and be 144,000? 
that I said was a literal number, and we proved that from the Bible. 144,000 is a literal number. This is going to get good today. Oh, it's good every week. The 144,000 was a literal number because a few verses down it says, and there's a great multitude that's going to stand on the sea of glass singing praise to God that you cannot number. But God gave a specific number to John, and he also shares that specific number and reveals it to the pen of inspiration. And it is, in fact, 144,000. Now, out of that 144,000 that are translated who do not taste death, they're sealed under what? The third angel's message. And the third angel's message began in 1844, October, at the end of 2,300-day prophecy by Daniel. Now, all those people sealed have been given a promise. Have they not? Go back with me in your Bibles again. Revelation 14. All right, let's go to verse 13 this time. Say amen when you're there. Amen. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write. Here's what he's going to write. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from when? From henceforth. Did I make this stuff up? No. Well, the big question my mind has now is, oh, what blessing is this? Inquiring minds want to know. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. From when? From the time of the third angel's message. Because that is the subject there. That's the topic. Yea, saith the Spirit. Saith who? Spirit. And we all know who this Spirit is, right? Mm -hmm. All right, now some people say, well, this is the angel that was sent forth to talk to John. Well, I'm going to tell you this. If Christ commissioned an angel to come to you and speak his words, whose Spirit are you receiving? Christ. That's plain and simple. Christ's Spirit. That they may rest from their labors and their what? Their works. their works do follow them. They were Sabbath keepers who were given the seal. We're just above this. What is the patience of these saints? What is the patience of these saints? They are a commandment keeping people who had the faith of Jesus. You can't be just a commandment keeping people. And say, we got the commandments, we don't need Jesus. That's what the Pharisees said. And you can't be these Sunday worshiping churches who say, we have Jesus, we don't need those commandments. I'm sorry, you got it wrong. The Bible says they are both the commandment keeping people with the testimony. That's another way to put it. With the testimony. The faith of Jesus. Most of the time what I find is all these Sunday worshipers that say, we have Jesus, I'm saved by grace. They don't even have the testimony of Jesus. Seven women take hold of one man. They want his name, but they want to eat their own bread. They want to do their own thing. They have no idea. You know why they have no idea? Because they don't have faith. Because if they had faith, they would be in the school of Christ. Make sense? I'm getting excited again. I got to keep, I got to keep calming myself. I am very passionate. Be zealous. I'm in love with the Lord. I'm sorry. I have to admit my guilt. I'm in love with God, and I'm in love with the Lord with all of my heart. As a matter of fact, the last time I, I checked, I think Jesus said, the greatest commandment of all, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Amen. That's the sum of the first four commandments, and it's also the beginning of the Shema. It's a direct quote from Deuteronomy chapter 6. It's nothing new under the sun. It was old, and it goes way back to the beginning of Israel. That's amazing stuff, isn't it? 
So what we've learned here is that the blessing of those who are sealed under the... So don't lose hope. Remember what I said last week? I said strive to be among them. You may not be numbered with them because they're going to be alive and they will not taste death. But you can be among them in the special resurrection. Wait a minute. There's no special resurrection in Houston. There's a resurrection one time and there's a resurrection a second time. What special resurrection are you talking about? Well, didn't Jesus say that these men were going to see him coming in the glory of his father? Those wicked men? Well, that tells me they're going to be resurrected to see the next advent of Jesus. But does that mean they're going to be persecuted right then? Or are they going to be condemned right then? Or are they judged right then? Or do they go back to their graves for 1,000 years? They come back mortal. They come back in the mortal body. They see the next return of Christ to their... Well, don't believe me. Turn with me to... Let's go back to Daniel. Y'all believe Daniel, don't you? Go with me to Daniel chapter 1. Let's go back in our Bibles again. Uh, already I hear somebody thinking. Y'all like the way I phrase that? Already I hear somebody thinking. Oh, that ain't the case. Houston, you don't know what you're talking about. I hear somebody thinking. Yeah. <laughs> now, y'all do realize I'm being sarcastic a little bit. <laughs> I can't read minds. I can't. But, but already I hear somebody thinking. That, that, that's just not biblical, Houston. Okay, for all those people thinking that. Let's go to Daniel chapter 12. I like a good challenge. I like to find my way around the Bible, too. If I need to stop talking long enough to find it. All right, let's go to Daniel. <clears throat> Daniel verse, uh, chapter 12 and verse 1. Say amen when you're there. Amen. And at that time shall Michael, who? Michael. And at the time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to the same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Everyone that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting what? Life. Wait a minute. Some to everlasting what? And some to what? Shame. Are they are they raised for judgment? Are they raised for judgment? Yes. No shame. No, they're not raised for the judgment. They're raised for everlasting shame and contempt. So now we see something happening here. This is when Michael stands up. Not when Michael returns. He is not here yet. But I'm going to tell you what happens, and we're going to show this more next week. I'll get in more depth on it. God is going to speak from his own throne room. God himself. And when God speaks, this earth is going to shake. Great earthquake is going to take place. And when that great earthquake takes place, he's going to speak the time and the hour to the saints on the return of his son. And when he speaks that, some will be resurrected at that time. At that time, there was going to be a resurrection because Michael has stood up and said, it is done. It's finished. But he's not came yet in the glory, in the power and glory of his father. When he stands up, this earth is, all right, let's go back and think about this. When Jesus was on the cross, he says it twice. He says on the cross, he says it is finished. finished. When he stands up in heaven, he says it is finished. finished. When he was on the cross and he said it is finished, earthquake. what happened? Earthquake. It was a mighty graves earthquake in that up. area. And what happened during that earthquake? The graves opened up. People come up. The graves opened. The people did not come out. They were open. They the graves were open. People didn't come out. Yet. 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 Running ahead of me, bro. Okay. <laughs> Not yet. But that's okay. You're on the right track. Jesus said, it is finished on the cross. What happened? He shut his eyes. He said, in your hands I commit my spirit, Father. And he went to the tomb. On 
the third day of his resurrection. There was another mighty earthquake, wasn't there? Anybody remember that? When the mighty angel came down and walked up to the tomb, there was a mighty earthquake on the earth again, and he rolls back the stone and he sets up on it. Two earthquakes happened. Two earthquakes. And Christ comes walking out of that tomb. What happened with all of those graves that had been opened sometime earlier? People come out of the tomb. Is that a special resurrection? Yes. Yeah, it is. It's a special resurrection. And they were the first fruits at that time. They were the first fruits at that time. The 144,000 represent the first fruits of the harvest. These that resurrected with Christ in the Bible represent the first fruits of the first harvest. We have a Another harvest coming. This is getting pretty good already. Isn't it? So when God speaks from his throne room, guess what happens? It's going to be the mightiest earthquake this earth has ever felt. And what do you suppose happens to all them graves? They're going to split wide open. And all of a sudden, I'm right here with Daniel. And Daniel says, there's a special resurrection that's getting ready to take place here. Some of these folk are going to be resurrected to everlasting life. You know what's going to happen? They were sealed under the third angel's message and they're going to stand with the 144,000. But there's going to be others resurrected also in the mortal flesh. Now think about this. When Lazarus was resurrected, did he come back into immortality? No. When Christ brought Lazarus back from the grave, did he bring him back into immortality? No, no he did not. He brought him back as a same mortal, same mortal body, same mortal decrepit body that he went to sleep in. He brought him back. Well, you want to know about the special resurrection? Same thing. They come back in their same decrepit mortal bodies. But for those who are raised for everlasting life, they're going to be translated, guess with who? The living saints. They're going to be translated up into the heaven with the living saints, 144,000. And those who persecuted Christ, who mocked him, who persecuted him, who tortured him are also going to see his coming. They're resurrected especially. And all of those great opposers out there in the world, oh, don't worry, you'll get to resurrect too to see his coming. And the Father's going to make it so. But it's not a resurrection unto life. It's a resurrection unto everlasting shame and contempt. In verse 3, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. That's a beautiful promise. We can cover more on this later. I want to move on from here. Wow, where did the time go? Hey, it just feels like it just started. Everybody else feel that too? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I feel like it just started talking. It's already been an hour. Time flies. <laughs> well, I was going to go into saviors. Well, you know what? Mm. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Mm -mm -mm. All right, I'm going to jump ahead, and then I'm going to come back. I'm going to make another sermon next week. We're going to talk more about these 144,000. Okay, we're going to pick it up again next week on 144,000, and we're going to go into a greater depth on the saviors, and then I'm going to move from there. But for today, I want to conclude with this. I can't. This is too good to let go. I got to share this. I'm sorry. Y'all want to go a few more minutes with me? Everybody good? Okay. Any objections? Anybody opposed? Your final chance. 
All right, I'm going to go into this. All right, turn with me again in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 7. Let me make sure I'm in the right place here. Yeah, turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 7. This is too good to let go. I had to share it today. This is going, it's still about 144,000. And we're going to go into more depth. Now, by the way, I want to share this with y'all. Most people say that when you're sealed under the three angels' messages, that you're going to be one with the 144,000. They're teaching that you are one of the 144,000. It is not correct according to my understanding. Okay, you cannot be one of those 144,000 if you don't remain alive because you're not representing the Elijah. Did Elijah taste death? Did Elijah taste death? Did Elijah get translated? There's the one type of resurrection. That's the translation of the Elijahs. Remember I said those who look so much like Jesus. They don't taste death, period. But then you have the resurrection, and you're going to have a special resurrection according to the third angel. Blessed are they. Why are they blessed? Because they're going to be resurrected between the sixth and seventh plagues. They're going to witness the seventh plague falling upon this earth, and they're also going to witness the return of Jesus Christ. Oh, that's deep. I'm going to share more on it next week. Why? You know why? Because they were sealed under this third angel's message from 1844 onward. That's why the pen of inspiration says, strive to be among them. I want to be among them. If I'm not one of them, I at least want to be among them. But more importantly, I just want to find myself in heaven. So whether I'm among them or not, I want to be resurrected Amen. unto everlasting life. Amen. So, and, and the reason why I brought all this up is I don't want y'all to be confused. The seal of God is the seal of God. You had the seal of God of men of old. You had those who were sealed under the third angel's message from 1844. And then you had the living saints the 144,000 who are sealed and translated, not tasting death. You see where I'm going with this? So let's go ahead and make that di differentiation. We can all... I'll go into this more depth next week too. Who seals you? Who is it that seals us? So if the Holy Spirit seals us, what about all those people who died years and years ago, even before the third angel's message came? Who seals them? Who seals them? The Holy Spirit. Men of old were saved by their faith. They looked forward. They were living in the shadows. They looked forward to a coming Savior. Today, we are saved through our faith because we can look back at history and see we have that advantage it's already happened it's come he's come it took place he fulfilled four, 385 prophecies at the crucifixion the probability of that happening is beyond my comprehension he fulfilled over 1200 prophecies in his coming Plus, more, more. I'm not sure exactly what the number is. That could be all, but a lot. But here's what I want to share today. In Revelation chapter 7, there are some tribes of this 144,000. Let's go back to these 144,000. And we're going to read, let's read uh, from Revelation one through four. And at these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind shouldn't blow, should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on the tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, 
and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels. Now, those who died before are sealed by the Holy Spirit. This angel has the seal of God, which represents holiness unto Yahuwah. These men are going to become pure, holy unto the Father while they're standing on the earth. And by the way, some have already received that seal since 1844. But they will not be in the number of the 144,000. They, they will be with the 144,000. So then we're clear on this. That's my understanding as of right now. In verse 3, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them that were sealed. He heard this number spoken to him. And there were sealed 144,000 of the tribes of the children of Israel. Now, if you read the tribes of the number of Israel from here on, you'll find that two tribes of the original, Dan and Ephraim, are completely left out. Which would have totaled 14 tribes. But Dan and Ephraim are not there. But you remember... Joseph had Joseph. two sons. One son makes it, and the other son doesn't. Dan gets replaced, and Joseph's, Joseph's son, Ephraim, doesn't make it. That tribe doesn't make it. Why don't these two tribes make it? You don't have to write. You don't have to look it up, but you can just jot it down, or you can make the recording. Deuteronomy 29, 18 to 21, Hosea 5, 9 to 11. It's because of their idolatrous ways that they don't make it idolatrous ways. They don't make it. But they get replaced. And by the way, some people I've heard say, oh, all of this only applies to Israel. No, it does not. It, re it applies to spiritual Israel. Israel died a long, long time ago. The tribes of Israel are not here today. This prophecy is for the end time. And it applies to spiritual Israel. And I can prove that from Scripture, and I will next week. We don't have enough time today. <laughs> so, now if you look at the arrangement of these 12 tribes. I wish I would have wrote that here. I didn't. Okay. Uh, if you look at their arrangement in order, it is Judah, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Natali, Manas um, Manasseh, Man uh, Manasseh uh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Ze, uh, Ze, uh, Zebulon, uh, Joseph, and Benjamin. That's the order. That's the order of the 12 tribes in this reading. Now, when New Jerusalem comes, and I'm not going to go there because we don't have time. Time is not going to permit. There are 12 gates and 12 foundations. On the 12 gates, there is a name written. What is that name? It's one of the tribes of Israel. It's one of these names I just mentioned. Okay? One of their names is on one of those 12 gates. And on the 12 foundations in the city, there is a name written. What are those names? The disciples. Name. It is the 12 apostles of Christ. Their names are written on the foundations, and the 12 tribes of Israel are written on the 12 gates of the great city. Okay, I want to point that out right now. Now, each one of these names represent a character, and it has a description according to Scripture. I'm going to go really fast, okay? Is that okay? Mm -hmm. All right, if y'all want my notes, I'll share them with you, but I want to share this story with you. Each one of these means something, and you can find it in the book of Genesis. I think Genesis will sum up every one of these tribes in their meanings according to their own Hebrew names. You'll find every bit of it in Genesis. And Judah, for instance, represents, Now I praise the Lord. yod heh wah -Heh. Now I praise the Lord. Reuben has looked, it means, his very name means, has looked upon my affliction. Gad, name, means, how fortunate. Or a troop coming. Or a great army coming. How fortunate. Asher means, the prosperous one, happy am I, happy am I. I can go on, but I'm going to sum it up now. I'm going to read 
I'm going to put all of this together in these 12 tribes from Judah to Benjamin in its order according to its meaning. Y'all want me to read it to you? You want to hear? This is the ceiling of the 144,000 of the saints who keep the commandments of God and have the faith or the testimony of Jesus Christ. Let me read the story to you. Oh, this is beautiful. Don't miss it. I was going to go into more depth on this, but uh, there's not enough time. All right, here is how it reads in their meaning. Now will I praise yod heh wah -Heh. Remember, holiness under you. Now will I praise yod heh wah -Heh. Surely yod heh wah -Heh has looked upon my affliction. How fortunate a troop come. Happy am I. With great wrestlings have I wrestled. And I have prevailed. That sound familiar? Mm -hmm. The time of trouble. <coughs> Jacob's time of trouble. Oh, this is lining up perfectly, isn't it? For God has made me forget all my toil. Because yod heh the father, has heard that I was hated. He has therefore given me this son. Now this time will my husband be joined unto me. God has endowed me with a good gift. My husband will dwell with me. Amen. The father, yod heh wah -He, shall add to me Thou shalt have this son, who is the son of my right hand. Jesus. Now, I'm going to ask this. This yod heh wah is definitely the father, who has given these saints his son in marriage. And he himself, God, has added his son to you and I. Will you accept his invitation today Amen. and be married? Do you want to resurrect with those 144,000? Be, be Strive to be among them. If we're fortunate enough to be alive when Christ comes, then we can be one of them. But if we're not, strive to be among them. That should be our goal today. Accept the marriage proposal and embrace his son. Let's go to prayer. Holy Father, we thank you for all the perfect and beautiful gifts you have given us. But most importantly, we praise you and thank you for your beautiful son, Yeshua HaMashiach of Nazareth. Blessed be thy name in the highest, Holy Father. We are so in love with you. We are so in love with our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Lord, we invite you to come into our hearts. Change our ways. Help us in this purification time. Help us in the affliction of our own souls. Keep us on track. Keep our eyes focused on you. We do not want to fall backwards into a dark, dreary world. Lord, we want to be where you are. Keep us as yours for all eternity. We pray these things unto you, Holy Father, in Jesus' precious, beautiful, most holy name.